Okay, let's get started. Welcome back to Statistics 115-215. Today we're going to start the first module on gene expression. And the very first topic is gene expression microarrays. So um, over the history, there are actually many different type of arrays invented. We're only going to talk about one type, which is from a company called Affymetrics. This technology was invented at around Stanford and the Bay Area, around 1995, and it became very, very popular in the early 2000s. Later, high throughput sequencing came around, and nowadays nobody is really using Affymetrix arrays anymore, but we thought a lot of the algorithms that are developed for bioinformatics are very, very applicable for other questions as well, and is a good start for, for the time when statisticians or biostatisticians really started to play an important role in computational biology. So the Affymetrix microarray is like this. Um, the size is about one cent square, centimeter squared. Basically, um, this array has millions of probes. If you zoom in, so this is the array, and if you look at one corner, this is one probe location, but on this location, you can see there are still millions of probes that contain the same sequence. So in the array, when it's designed, the company would know in which location, which X and which Y, this probe is, is having this sequence and it's supposed to target a, a different, like a gene in the genome, okay? And so you buy this array from Affymetrics, and when scientists are about to do the RNA expression analysis, they can grow the cell or you can take out the tissue from some animals or, or the human, say, tumor. You collect the RNA, you convert this into cDNA, which is basically you convert it into a DNA form that you can amplify, you can label, because RNA is very difficult, harder to manipulate. And so you get the RNA, you convert to cDNA, and you label this um, R, uh, cDNA with some fluorescence. And then you hybridize this solution. It's a mixture of different RNAs onto this microarray. And so you can see here, these are the cDNA, which were kind of initially from the RNA from that sample. And this is a particular sequence that is able to hybridize to the probe at this location. Um, and the, the cDNA here comes with a fluorescent label, okay? And the, the purple one here is not going to hybridize to a probe at this location. It's going to hybridize to a different location on the, the array. And then we wash off the, you know, you hybridize, you wash off, and to make sure only the correct sequence are hybridized to the correct location on this array. And so this mixture, every RNA will find its own place to hybridize. And then we will excite, we shine lights onto the array, and then there is a scanner to read out the signals at different locations. For example, in this location, you can see this is the, all the probes that have the same sequence. It's hybridized to the same uh, cDNA or the original uh, RNA, representing the original RNA. And this location really lights up because there are a lot of RNA or, or cDNAs containing that fluorescent label coming here. And so when you excite, this spot will be very bright. In this location, the probe sequence is here, but maybe it's targeting a gene that is not expressed, or at least not highly expressed in that condition, then there are not so many cDNA molecules with the fluorescent attached to this location. Then this spot will be fairly dark. On this Affymetrix array, there are millions of probes in here, and you can see some spots light up and other spots are pretty dark. And uh, on the top, you see Affymetrix. Uh, they have some spike in uh, cDNA in there to make sure that you can read this out. Okay, so having this Affymetrix thing on the top, make sure at the end, when the scanner look at this, because you're trying to align millions of cells, having the spike in will make sure that the grid is aligned correctly when it's reading X and Y, it's correct, it's the correct spot, okay? So that's the um, Affymetrix array and how roughly how it works. There are some 
interesting design considerations. So in the very early days, this array was not really in a production industrial scale. Uh, at the very early days, people actually spotted these arrays uh, with hands or later on with graduate students made the little robotics uh, automation machines. And so every time the array is made, sometimes some spots are bigger than others. Um, and so people used to do technical replicates. So the same study, you do it uh, a couple of times, but for technical replicate is you grow the cell once, you collect the RNA, but the same RNA you hybridize on different arrays to generate a different replicates. So these are called the technical replicates. These are usually needed when you're not so confident about your array quality. Um, in the early day, graduate students spotted arrays, you know, there could be a smudge in here or some spots becoming bigger or smaller. Um, most of the time, people don't do as much technical replicates anymore. They do biological replicates. So nowadays, if you have a expression microarray experiment, uh, usually the reviewers would need three replicates for each condition. So what are the different level of biological replicates? Uh, so technical replicate was used a lot in the early days, but now people mostly do biological replicates. The very low level of biological replicates is if you are doing an experiment on a petri dish. This is a cell line. You can grow some worms. You can grow in a very or like well-controlled condition. But just say the cell is grown in different dish or it's grown on different days and uh, the cells are collected or RNA is collected on different days. Uh, could be by the same person or by different person. You can imagine the more variabilities the, the bigger the difference in the final data. And so the very, like very simplest way, at least to grow the cells in different dishes, even if it's the same cell line, you treat them with the same reagent and it's the same gradual student handling the, the pipette and collecting the RNA. That's the very minimum level of biological replicates. And in order to get a microarray studies published, you need three of those replicates. Um, the, the slightly better type of biological replicates are um, animals. Say we do a mouse experiment, right? You treat the mice with some drug and you see how their tumors grow or shrink. And the mice, you know, even if they are litter mate mice, grown or, or raised in the same cage, there might still be some differences. Some exercise more, you know, they, they eat the same diet, they kind of live the same, in, in the same condition, there's, there, there's still more potential differences. In some sense, this is considered a slightly better biological replicate because you do capture real world differences better. And the third or even higher level of biological replicates are, let's just say, if we want to compare cancer normal or some diseased individual with normal uh, individual is either you draw blood or take the tissues or tumors out or brains or whatever and uh, the individuals you know first of all the diseased individuals they are not litter made they're not siblings they they are different age different gender they grow up in different places they have very different lifestyle so you can imagine the biological replicates there will have even bigger variabilities and if you still at the end see the same behavior of, say, cancer versus normal, you're more confident that you're, that you're observing something correctly. Um, because of the, the data variability, I would say the technical replicates should have the smallest variability, three, well, now we don't even need to do it. For petri dishes, you know, three would be enough, but sometimes when you are doing a mouse experiment, or if you are doing even human, because the variability is pretty high, you might need more than three replicates to even see anything. For example, if we want to see a cancer normal difference, you will need more than three cancer patients, for sure. For mouse, you might need to use three or five, but for human, you might need to take 20 patients, uh, normal and 20 uh, tumor patients to get there. But replicates are always needed, at a minimum three when you're just dealing with petri dish, okay? Uh, why do we still bother about learning microarrays? 
when mm. microarray was first invented, it cost about one to two thousand dollars a sample or, or an array. Mm. It, it doesn't account for the graduate student operating the, 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 the cells and getting the RNA labeled and stuff. Nowadays, you can probably get an array for a few hundred dollars. It is much, much cheaper. Um, but RNA-seq, uh, when uh, high throughput sequencing was first invented uh, in, or became available in 2007 or 2008, mm -hmm. each sample cost about $2,000 as well. But now it can cost as low as $200 to $300, depending on how deep you sequence. So the, the, the cost of RNA-seq is lower now. You, you do get a much more reliable result with RNA-seq. So if you are going to do an experiment now, for sure, you use RNA seq. Don't use microarray. In fact, um, I'm not sure if even Affymetric even sell these research level microarrays now. They probably sell some small arrays with 20 genes for biomarker detection. So they don't sell these genome wide expression arrays anymore. Uh, the, the, but the reason we are still learning about microarrays is if you look at the publicly available data, in uh, NCBI. So NCBI have a resource called uh, uh, Gene Expression Omnibus, or GEO, where basically if you publish a study, the reviewers or the journals very often require you to deposit the data so other people can reproduce the results. And there are still a lot of useful information from microarrays that you can use, right? So the amount of public data is very good. And also, the data analysis techniques that we're going to teach you, a lot of them were developed for microarrays. Some of them are also being applied to analyze RNA-seq, but other ones you can see still works better than, on microarrays than RNA-seq. So um, we kind of want to gradually ease you into RNA-seq, but we start from microarrays. Okay. Um, once you get the Affymetrix uh, microarray data, the, by the time you look at the data, there are two types of cells, uh, uh, files you would need. The first file is called a cell file. It's the raw data you get per sample. Every sample you hybridize to the array, when the scanners scan the array, the signal file come back will be... So Affymetrix machine, they, they provide an algorithm which convert the original image into a data file. There are a lot of headers. Uh, for example, Affymetrix keep track of, they, they have a serial number for all of their machines. They also have the day this array is scanned. So you can see some potential, uh, we'll talk about batch effect later. So every machine scanned on every day, there is a, some ID. And so every array has a different kind of uh, ID. But the, the information that is really useful is usually millions of rows of information like this. It says on this array, on the X axis, this X location, on this Y location. So in that probe location, remember we have millions of probes carrying the exact same sequence and they can hybridize to mul multiple RNA molecules for the same gene, right? So the, that's why you get a quantitative measure. And so on this array, uh, you can imagine it's roughly a square, but within, when you use scanner to scan, the actual pixels is a seven by seven pixel. But very often, Affymetrix only take the middle three by three, uh, or five by five, or four by four, or five. So, so because the, the edge, towards the edge, sometimes the neighboring cell will have signal bleeding over. So they usually only take the middle 9, 16, or 25 pixels. And based on the average signal within here, yeah, so this row will say this X and this Y location, um, it's the signal coming from the middle 16 pixels. The mean signal is this, and the standard deviation is this. Um, in the very early days when the array was not very well designed, uh, you can adjust for these parameters and also take out spots that have too big a variation. I think most of the machines or the scan arrays later on, there's no problem. And so basically this just tell you at which location, what is the signal. So usually the first three columns are the more important ones, okay? And every sample will have a cell file. The second data type is this uh, CDF file. This is only one file used for each array type. So if you buy a human 
array or a, a mouse array, it will come with different CDF files. It just tell you on this array at which X, Y location is this probe sequence which is targeting what gene, okay? So, yeah, so that's kind of the, um, you, you know how the array is designed and you say, okay, this group of X, Y locations are having a probe set. Probe set is basically a group of probes that target the same gene. And on this FE matrix array, I'll show you in here. In addition to having a probe that like directly hybridize, having um, reverse complement to your RNA, which, which is the exact sequence to your target transcript, that, that this, this probe is called a perfect match probe. There's usually also a mismatch probe. This mismatch probe has, so FE matrix, their probes are of 25 nucleotide in length. Everything else is the same except on the 13th position, the middle position, which is usually a reverse, or is, is a complementary sequence. So if the perfect match is a G, the mismatch will be a C. If the perfect match is a T, the mismatch will be a A, but everything else will be the same, okay? And very often, well not often, all of the time, the mismatch probes is just right next to the perfect match probe on this array. And uh, in order to really get a good readout, very often FE metrics, uh, depending on the different generations of the array, um, there's, uh, for human, there's a U95, U133, and so like axon array, different generations of array. I think FE push out a different generation of array every three, four years. In the early days, uh, they might have 20 pairs of these perfect match and mismatch probes on the array. Um, you can see here is the signal on the perfect match and the signal on the mismatch probes. Most of the time, ca can you guess why FE metrics have a mismatch probe? Sam. Ah, so, um, in case the sequence is different from the reference genome. It's not the main purpose of this. Um, you can imagine this is a probe set. They are supposed to be measuring the expression of the same gene. But if you look at the perfect match value, they differ by quite a lot, right? So the mismatch probe is there to measure the background noise. How much is cross-validation? How much noise do you have? And so the idea is, if you look at the difference between the perfect match and the mismatch, then you will hopefully get the real signal. Okay, so that was the original purpose. And so for FE metrics to come up with this probe set, usually they have either 10 pairs, 15 pairs, or 20 pairs, depending on different generation of the array. Later on, they decided they're gonna only use perfect match. We'll, we'll explain why that is the case. Um, and so all of these, are targeting the same gene. And this is the RNA. Um, most of the probes are designed towards the end of the transcript. So if you are familiar with uh, RNA, the beginning of the mRNA transcript is called a five prime. The end is called three prime. And most of the probes are designed towards the end. This is in case the RNA has decayed. The decay usually happens from the five prime. The three prime end is more stable. And so even if you, you store the tumor a little bit in some RNA degradation, hopefully the three prime signals are still fairly stable. So most of the probes are designed towards the end. And you can see here, these are the locations where FE de de designed the probes. And this is the probe signal. The, and this whole thing is called a probe set, okay? So the, remember the probe definition um, was a CDF file. Turns out over the years, this probe definition file, there are some evolution. Because when the first FE matrix array was developed, this is like 95, 97, human genome sequence hasn't been finished yet. And so over the years, you know, by the time 2003, we finished the human genome project, there's also effort to annotate genes, decide what are the genes in the genome. And so, the same probe might end up being assigned to a different gene or something. And so over the years, 
um, there are different CDFs designed. In addition, you can see here, this is one gene, it's called F HFE. So on this gene, there are some exons and there are some introns. But you can see from the same gene, because of alternative splicing, there are different transcripts or different RNA that use different combination of the exon. They will make a different RNA. And so you can see here on Affymetrix, they, in the early days, they may not really know all the transcripts, so they designed a different probe. So every time you see a little red thing in here, it's a group of different probes targeting some exons. And by the way, the, this gene is pretty long. There are more thing, exons to the left, but we're just looking at the three prime end of this gene. And so you can see there are a lot of probes designed around these areas. Um, and they target the, even though they are supposed to be targeting the same gene, they actually target different exons and also could be targeting different transcripts. And so when you are analyzing gene expression, sometimes your collaborator might only be interested in knowing a transcript, which is called a reference seek. And so that's based on the RNA, this particular transcript or that particular transcript. But sometimes they may not know. They say, oh, I'm only interested in this FP or HFE gene. And so you can imagine, depending on whether they want to look at the transcript or the gene, you will be using a different CDF file. The definition of a group of probe sets is different. Right? Because um, imagine you are interested in this top transcript, then you will not use the probes in here. But if you're interested in this whole gene, you're going to take all of the probes in. Okay, so you can see depending on what you want to get, you will take a different CDS. And um, in 2005, this is after the Human Genome pro Project has finished, um, there are there is an update on the genome annotation, and uh, when you remap the probe to the genome based on the annotation, you can see this can potentially cause 30% difference in the final differential gene expression analysis. So make sure that you use the newest annotation of the probe set, which is available on Bioconductor. So if you have started looking at homework one, you will be asked to use Bioconductor to run an algorithm called RMA, which we'll talk about later, and make sure you use the newest annotation. But also, depends on whether you're looking at genes or transcript. It's a different file, okay? Questions? <laughs>